Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey everyone, welcome back to another amazing episode of For the Love of Money, and this is one of your favorite types of episodes. You guys love when I have my wife on and we banter about life, and today is going to probably be maybe the best of them all because we're getting ready for this talk in Las Vegas, and it's in front of literally thousands of entrepreneurs, and when they asked us to speak, we thought, okay, what do we want to share? We have all these different things that we can share, and we decided we're just going to tell a few stories that at the time, maybe didn't feel significant, but when we look back on them, taught us some of the best lessons in life and have been instrumental in forming the life that we have right now. So we're about to share three or four or five or six or whatever number of stories come out on this podcast and the lessons that came along with them for all of you. Now, as we do this, it's your job to simply find yourself in the story. And you might find yourself in Lori's stories, you might find yourself in my stories, but when you find yourself in the story, that's where you can make our lesson your lesson and speed up your path to whatever type of life it is that you are looking for. And by the way, speaking of speeding up the path to your ideal life, Lori and I have launched a free training series. Go to becomealigned.com and they're a free training series that's very similar to stories that you're about to hear. We talk about some of the lowest moments of our life, but the lessons we learned. We talk about some of the most intimate moments of our life and the lessons that we learned. And we really just share all of the hacks that we've adopted in order to lead what I call a full circle rich life. And that means rich in every way. And I'll explain that later in the podcast, what that really means. So go to becomealigned.com, check out the free training, and depending when you go there, we're actually reintroducing, re-enrolling our really popular e-course that we launched this spring called Aligned. Now, we only enroll people for seven days in it because we don't want it to be too big because when you enroll in it, we do live group coaching where we answer your Q&A and talk you through any issues that you are going through as we go through all nine modules that deal with your belief systems, your rituals, and your tribe. And so if you're intrigued, check that out as well. It's the same website, becomealigned.com. There's only going to be seven days that you can enroll in it. So when you go check out the website, if enrollment is not open yet, no problem. Throw your email in there. Don't worry. You'll be the first to know. It is literally life-changing for the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that got to go through it the first time. Maybe the most fulfilling thing we've ever done up to this point. So go check out the free training. Go check out the e-course. Go check out whichever one you prefer at becomealigned.com. Hi, everyone. It is Chris and Lori on the podcast today. What's up? And we are preparing right now for a talk that we're going to do in Las Vegas. And if any of you were not there this weekend, then you get to hear everything that we talked about and everything that we shared at the talk. So today we are going over some of the stories that have really changed our life. And as we go through some of these stories, which I think you're going to find a lot of them kind of humorous, it's your job to try and find yourself in some or all of the stories. You know, these are stories that little moments in life at the time probably didn't feel very significant to us. I guess a couple of them did, but they ended up giving us some pretty significant insight on how to lead the kind of life that we have today. And so... You know, it's, it's my belief that we were all put here to lead a really, really rich life. And when I say a rich life, I don't just mean monetarily, but I also mean a rich in experience, rich in fulfillment, rich in contribution, rich in impact, rich in love, rich in all those good things. And without being able to find yourself in other people's stories and learn from some of their mistakes, then you're going to have a hard time getting to this fully well-rounded type of rich life that I believe everybody's entitled to live. So Lori, why don't you just kind of kick it off with one of yours? So we now lovingly call this 
the great chicken nugget battle of 2006. Oh, God. (laughs) So we were about a year into our marriage, and we had just moved from Green Bay to Green Bay, Wisconsin, to Waukesha, Wisconsin. And Chris had been promoted from uh, his current job to a new position. So as soon as we moved... He went straight to work and I went straight to organizing our life and our home and joining the gym and doing all of the busy things that I could stay busy with so that I could keep my mind off of what I was going to be doing. And once the dust settled, it came time for me to start job hunting. Now, this for me was always something that was challenging because I had a story in my mind that because I grew up in a small town, I had a restrictive religious background that only allowed me to hang out with people in my religion, which was not a lot of people, and that I was homeschooled through high school and I wasn't educated. This was the story that was on repeat and would flare up with a vengeance whenever I would go to look for jobs. So would be another day and I would be looking at job applications that I was not qualified for. Well, this would throw me into a complete frenzy of not being enough and crying all day and feeling anxious and going right back into the story of blaming my life, blaming my parents and blaming Chris for moving me (laughs) into a new city of why I'm not capable of being happy. So it was weeks and weeks and weeks of applying for jobs and then Chris coming home and me complaining to him because at the time I did not have any other friends either. So he was the source of all of my joy, all of my conversation, and also all of my pain all at once. So when he came home one day, I decided to just unload on him again and tell him why I didn't think I was capable of getting these jobs that I wanted and why I never thought that I would fulfill my dreams of competing in fitness competitions and being a fitness inspiration. And at that point, I think he'd just been fed up and I watched something come over him and he looked at me and he said, I cannot listen to this anymore. You either need to piss or get off the pot. I can't do this for you and no one can. And in that moment, I just had a moment of truth. And I realized that I had married the devil himself. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of true. So so I ran into my bedroom screaming and, and telling him how terrible he was through the door, literally having a full on temper tantrum and how uncompassionate he was. I mean, how... Could he think that I was responsible for having panic attacks, for having debilitating anxiety and for my past and for not being edgy? This wasn't my fault. This was my family's fault. Yet there was a part of me that deep down knew he was 100% right. And I was pretending not to know that I was going to have to face my fears and that I had control over all this. So it wasn't long after this brutally truthful moment that Chris and I fell right back into our normal weekend routine, which is we would go out for a date night, we'd have a super indulgent dinner, and then we'd end the night with drinking even more all night. So we would stay out till two or three in the morning. And of course, what do you do when you stay out drinking all night? You go get fast food at about three o'clock in the morning. So... I have my food in my hand. I have this beautiful box of golden chicken nuggets. (laughs) (laughs) And we get back to our house. And I sit in the foyer of this beautiful new home with these soaring ceilings. And all of the night has now died down. Everything has gone away. And I am left with my thoughts. A lot of alcohol in my system. So I do what anyone who hates their lives would do in this position. And I have a complete meltdown. And I take one look at these chicken nuggets in my hand and one look at Chris's face. And I start dipping the chicken nuggets. 
and I start chucking them at the ceiling of our home and at his head, screaming about why I hate myself and I hate my life and I hate everything that is happening in this moment. I mean, it sounds kind of funny, right? I want you to picture me like these 25 foot ceilings and, and I'm up across on this bridge between, you know, in the foyer here and, and Lori's down below, 25 feet below, throw, dipping her nuggets, reaching back, launching and trying to chuck them up at me at three o'clock in the morning. And while that's kind of funny, what wasn't funny was this. We were clearly not a couple of people who were well on their way to leading a rich life at that time. And I just want to clarify for you, I said it earlier, but what I mean by rich is this. It's not just rich in money, although I am a huge fan of that. And I believe you are entitled to that as well. But I also mean rich in happiness, contribution, impact, rich in every full circle way. Matter of fact, I'll be frank with you. I don't know what each of you have in terms of goals in life, but you are not truly rich unless you are thriving in all of these areas, not just one of them. I honestly believe that we were put here to lead a really full circle rich life. And I want you to make no doubt about that. Now, here's the best part about some of life's lowest moments. And this was definitely one of our lowest moments is that they force you to make some really tough choices. And in this is one of those key moments that led us to creating a few key agreements on life that would go on to make us rich in every way. And and we're going to share some of those. Do I dare call them nuggets with you, Lori? Yes. (laughs) We're going to call them nuggets just for your entertainment. So that brings us to nugget number one. And that truly is, I knew I had to take ownership over my life, stories, happiness, and dreams. So taking full ownership over your life, stories, happiness, and dreams. And that was a moment for me where I had hated who I had become. And most of all, I hated knowing that I was choosing to settle. There's a beautiful quote by the gospel according to Thomas that says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. And it was the point where the pain of staying the same and not facing my fears far outweighed the pain of actually taking action. And action creates clarity, not sitting, not thinking, not crying, (laughs) not trying to get more information, but taking full ownership over my life and knowing that action creates clarity. So a few questions that you can ask yourself to take true ownership and your power back. And these are questions that I always ask myself is what are you pretending not to know? What are you pretending not to be capable of because it scares you? And what pain are you avoiding that could change everything for you? So, When Lori talks about taking 100% ownership of your life, one of the things I really like to point out is this. When When you accept that, like when you say, okay, wherever I am right now, this is my fault. I take 100% ownership of this exact moment in time in my life. That can be as frustrating and scary. I understand that. That can be as frustrating and scary as it is empowering. Because think about it. If you really had that much control that you put yourself exactly where you are right now at this point in life, like everything around you is truly your doing, that's a lot of power. So even if it hasn't turned out the way you wanted up to this point, you have that power to make it turn out however you want going forward. But none of that happens until you accept the fact that you are 100% responsible for every outcome in every moment of your life. Remember, you're not responsible for the circumstances or the events that happen to you. You are responsible for the outcome. Now, there was a time in my life where I had to take responsibility for my outcomes, for exactly where I was in life. You see, it wasn't that long ago. We always have these ups and downs, right? It wasn't that long ago, about three and a half, four years ago, that everything was good. Like I was just 
life was good, relationships were good, our house was good. But you want to know the thing about good? You probably heard the phrase before. Good is the enemy of great. And I knew that I had great inside of me. And so that gap from good to great was huge. It was lonely. It felt like crap. Matter of fact, the gap from good to great probably feels just as bad as the gap from not doing well at all to good, if not maybe worse. So I was doing what you do when things are just good, and that is I scrolling on Instagram. And I was scrolling and scrolling mindlessly, and I come across this video. And it's this guy in his garage, and he says, here is my Ferrari, here is my Lamborghini. And of course, those caught my attention because I'm a car lover. And then he pans to the walls, and he says, but here is what really matters the most to me in here. And there were walls full of books and books and books. All of the walls in his garage were covered in books. Now, a lot of you know who this guy is. His name is Ty Lopez. I did not know him at the time. Of course, I know him now. And this ad caught my attention. It went on to talk about how he reads a book a day, every single day of his life. And I thought to myself, if this successful entrepreneur can read a book a day, every single day of his life, then maybe I could read 30 books in 30 days. And it started to stew in me day after day after day. Like I knew I found the way that I was going to catch up to Lori. And here's what I mean when I say catch up to Lori. Lori was on a rocket ship. Lori was doing all the right things that it took in order to be successful, to lead a great life. She was doing, reading the books. She was assembling the tribe. She was going to the events. She was doing all of these things. Well, I just kind of stayed down here and good. And it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that one day she was going to end up way up here and I was going to still just be down here and good. And that was going to be too big of a gap for us to bridge and have a good relationship. And so I knew something had to be done. And this crazy idea of reading 30 books in 30 days seemed like just the thing, like just the thing to up-level me, to, to thrust me up to where she was at. And you want to know when I really knew that there was a problem, when I really had to take 100% responsibility for where I was at? I was sitting across from Lori at one point at dinner. And she was really excited. She was telling me about this exciting new opportunity that she had with exciting new people and these exciting new things that they were going to do. And I remember sitting there literally being resentful. I know, crazy, right? Like, who gets resentful when their spouse is on a high and excited about something? That's crazy. Yet, that's exactly where I was. And I was resentful, obviously, now looking back because I didn't like where I was at. And it was a reflection to me of my life, of where I should be going, what I should be doing. So sure enough, reading 30 books in 30 days was a must. And I remember when I went to Lori to tell her this crazy idea, I thought she was going to think I was insane. But instead, this look came over her face of like, not only acceptance, but probably excitement. Now she never said anything, but I could tell that she was glad I was going to do something like this too. So I cleared my schedule. I chose a handful of books. And here's how I chose the criteria for my books. They only had to be two things. Number one, they had to be less than 300 pages. So I had a shot at finishing it. (laughs) Number two, they had to improve me in some way. That's it. So there were like self-development books, spiritual books, business books, biographies, seven steps to this, you name it. All the books had a different agenda. They just had to improve me in some way. So I'm about 15 days in and I start to see a common thread form in these books. And the common thread is this, no matter what the book was trying to sell me, no matter what the book's agenda was, giving and generosity were a huge common thread in getting there. In other words, giving was quickly becoming, it was obvious, the secret to absolutely everything that you want in life. Want a better body? Give more to it. A better business? A better bank account? Give more to it. 
more happiness, a better relationship, give more to it. And it literally became this confirmation as I went on to read all 30 books out of, in 30 days that giving truly was the common thread to every single thing you want in life. Now, this has become like the DNA of who Lori and I are. And, and a lot of you know that watching us online and watching some of the things that we do. And one of the th ways that Lori and I refer to it is we call it an attitude of abundance. In other words, there's enough to go around. And for those of you that are entrepreneurs out there, you also have to realize that an attitude of abundance means there's enough customers to go around. There's enough business to go around. There's enough money to go around. And so quite honestly, if you're in a business where you feel like you're fighting over just a few customers, you're in the wrong business because that business has no upside. You should always find yourself in a place where you see abundance, the ability for everybody to have more than enough. And this especially applies, by the way, to relationships and business relationships. Matter of fact, I'm hyper intentional with how I give in my relationships. Like it's an extreme focus for me. I am always listening for what people need. And then I'm thinking of whom or what I could match them up with in order to help them. Another common thread in giving and generosity is that generosity is probably the one move that can make you rich in every way. It's one of the few moves that ticks all the boxes of rich. Quite honestly, I've made some of my greatest relationships through acts of generosity. I've created some of my best business relationships at charity galas. As a matter of fact, I was just asked to sit on an elite entrepreneur's board of a charity that I know is going to cultivate even more great relationships with people that I want to meet. It's become my DNA that, quite honestly, I don't want to spend time with people who don't spend time helping people. And I've found this actually to be true of, of most of my successful friends. And the thing that I've loved watching Chris do, especially because this truly is where he leads forward with really connecting with the people that he wants to connect with is just giving with no contingencies, no expectation, no attachment to the outcome, and just being someone that people want to be with, who they want to be around. And we've really watched our businesses and relationships completely transform from that. And this moves us right into nugget number three. I know you're all waiting <laughs> or you're hungry, either one. And that is build intentional tribes. So who listening has a dog or has ever trained a pet? Um, I can see you all raising your hands right now. <laughs> <laughs> is it better if I raise my hand? Yes, Chris raised his hand. Thank you. Thank you for being a captive audience. Okay, so when Chris and I first got our dog, Waffles, she was so naughty. I mean, we literally just thought that all dogs must be this naughty. She would taunt us. She would growl at us. She would jump up and she wouldn't just jump up and bite our clothes and tear them, which she did. She would jump up and bite our butts all the time. Like she literally had a butt fetish. So she ran our show. Like we were scared of our dog. <laughs> we were literally scared of our dog. So even at nine o'clock in the evening, we actually had a dedicated hour that we called nine o'clock psycho hour because she would legit go into full on, um, it, like she'd be possessed and run around the house biting. So we knew that we had to train this dog right away. So we took her to training. We learned a bunch of things that we were supposed to do. So essentially we got trained because we were quickly told that we were the reinforcers of good behavior. So while she got trained, while that was an amazing thing, if the behavior was not reinforced at home, this was never going to work. So they told us that whenever she would jump up, because this was the main thing, that whenever she would jump up, we were supposed to take ourselves out of the situation because what the dog really wants is your attention. 
So what I would do is when the dog would jump up, I would hide behind the kitchen pantry door or in a closet. I would spend my days hiding behind doors in order to train this dog. So the dog had become such a psycho that I knew I had to get a grip on it. So one day I decided to spend all day long training this dog. So per usual, Waffles would start jumping and biting my rear end in the morning And right away, I would go into the pantry and close the door. And as soon as I would hear her stop barking and stop clawing at the door like Cujo, I would finally reveal myself again and come out. And if she would jump up, I would tell her no and to sit and then immediately take myself out of the situation and hide in the pantry. So I had literally spent the whole day in the pantry training this dog and reinforcing her good behavior, really trying to uh, give her treats and let her know what a good girl she was when she would sit and not jump up. So Chris walks through the door from a long day at work and all of a sudden Waffles runs to him and I'm basically telling her to sit and I hear him say, up, 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 while he pats his chest and my world crumbles as I watch Waffles jump up on his chest and completely break everything that we had worked on for the whole day. Right after that, she wouldn't sit. She was right back to jumping, right back to the bad behavior, and I was right back to wanting to strangle my husband. So this isn't just about all of the training that you're putting in. This is not just about all of the self-work that you guys are doing, all of the work that you're doing on your business, all of the work that you're putting in to become the person that you want to be. This is about making sure that the people that you have around you are reinforcing the habits and beliefs that you want to keep in your life. Because it's not just your tribe. It's not just friends. It's not just family. This is truly the people that are reinforcing your beliefs. So they're either reinforcing limiting beliefs or they're telling you why it's possible. But a lot of us are running around with default tribes and we're settling for the beliefs of these default tribes because we believe That, well, if we were raised with this person or this is our sister or our parents or our family, that these are the people that we have to be around the most and we're never going to be able to transcend them. But what happens is we can start filling our life with more good than the reinforcers that are reinforcing what we don't want. So it's about filling your world with people Thoughts, ideas, books, podcasts, events, making sure that those things crowd out the things that were stopping you before, the people that were stopping you before. Making sure that you have people around you that are holding you to a higher standard. And this is going to require having an intentional tribe. So we don't realize that we have unspoken agreements with our current tribes. And a lot of those are all about um, living on perhaps their beliefs or their terms. And in order for our relationships to thrive and for us to start building these intentional tribes, it's going to require some structure and it's going to require some boundaries. So we have anxiety around the things and the people we have no boundaries around. So boundary is aligned between your personality and someone else's is the boundary between your life and someone else's. So if you have no boundaries, chances are you're actually living someone else's life and you're living on their terms and you probably have no energy for your goals and for the things that you want to be creating. And your dreams are going to require more space. And that means you're going to have to have some tough conversations in order to put some boundaries in your life. So more space, which means tough conversations. So Tim Ferriss has a quote, a person's success in life can be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations they're willing to have. And he also says, never underestimate the effects of your pessimistic, unambitious, disorganized friends. If they're not making you stronger, they're making you weaker. 
Your environment is always going to be stronger than your willpower. So this means you're going to have to be able to move out of environments, relationships, and things that are no longer working quickly in order for you to reach the goals that you have. So we can only grow as big as the pot that we're planted in. And it doesn't matter how much you're watering. It doesn't matter how much you're putting yourself in the sunlight. It doesn't matter how much you're trying to grow and doing all the right things if your pot is too small. And this is really where people get stuck is thinking that where they have been planted is where the only place that they can grow. And we forget that we can absolutely uproot our lives and we can transplant ourselves. But this is the scary part is there's that period when you are transplanting a plant or a tree. Who's ever done this? Who's ever done yard work or done any garden work or known anything about plants where when you take a plant from its small pot and you put it in the ground so that it can grow bigger, so that it can really be nurtured, or you're putting it in a bigger pot so that it can grow bigger. There's a period where it's touch and go. If you don't truly support this plant, if you don't make sure that it is nurtured, that it is watered, and that it is in an environment where it will thrive, you're probably going to lose the plant. So this is just like you. There's going to be that period where you are uprooting your life. It is going to feel crazy. You're going to feel like you do not, you don't know what you're doing, but if you can support yourself, if you can put yourself around people who also believe the same thing, who also feel like they are watering you, who are also believing that they can, that you can grow as big and as high as you want, then you're going to be able to thrive on the other side. So right now, a lot of you need to start looking at, are you in a pot that you can't get any bigger in? Is it time to uproot your life and transplant yourself and make sure that you are so supported so that you can truly thrive and grow on the other side? So make sure that you are building tribes for where you're going and not for where you're at. Listen, when you hear Lori talk about transcending people, I know it's scary. Matter of fact, this is what holds people back the most. Transcending people is the hardest thing to do. But remember this, you are never leaving them behind. They always have the choice to come along with you, right? Except our ego gets in the way because we're so afraid that they're not going to like us anymore. They're going to talk bad about us when we go where we're meant to go. And that kind of brings me to, I guess I'll call it a nugget, Lori, since you have so far. Nugget number four, and that is ego is your greatest overhead. This is literally a saying that I had to make up for myself because this is where I've had to grow the most. Ego is your greatest overhead. Ego is always going to cost you more than anything else in life. Ego will cost you opportunities when you don't grab a hold of them. Ego will cost you money when you spend it where you shouldn't just to impress other people. It'll also cost you money when you don't have that money that you already spent and a great investment opportunity comes up. Ego will cost you relationships. Ego will cause you to speak up when you shouldn't and to not say something when you should because you're worried what other people will think of you. Protecting your ego is always going to cost you more than any other single boneheaded move that we could ever, ever make. I've got a story where it cost me a ton. So, in right after the recession, when I left the big international bank, I took a partnership in a tiny little startup mortgage brokerage. There weren't a lot of job options. And I knew the gentleman, his name was Todd, who offered me this partnership. And Todd said, hey, you're really good at things that I'm not, and I'm really good at things that you're not. Come over here, be my business partner, and let's grow this thing. Now, remember, this is at the tail end of the recession, right? And I had just lost my job in, with this huge international bank. And Lori and I were literally starting over financially, like from below zero. So I take this partnership, and believe it or not, even though it's the tail end of the recession, we kill it. Like, we grow this business from this tiny little nothing mortgage brokerage to a mortgage bank with 155 employees in seven states doing over $330 million a year in just three years while everybody else was closing their doors. Like, wow, right? Must have been killing it money-wise. But we weren't, because here's why. 
when you grow a business, when you grow a startup, if you're doing it right, you're constantly reinvesting your profits into the business. And so our pay plan was very simple. He was a senior partner. I was a minority partner. After a certain amount of profit, anything that was left over, we would split 50-50. Except we were always reinvesting that money back into the business. So there were many months, months, month after month after month, where there was nothing left to split. Now, here is where I could have made some extra money. My business card said partner. And this was still prior to my self-development journey. So I had a lot of ego. I had just come from the banking world where I flew up through the ranks. And my importance at the time was what my business card said and how many people I managed. Anyone ever been there before? And so I had the opportunity while being a partner in this mortgage bank to also in the pockets of my day, write mortgages for other people, just like the loan officers do. And every time you'd write a mortgage, you'd get a really big commission. We're talking thousands of dollars each one. Except are you ready for this? My ego was so big. I was so worried about being and looking like a partner that I thought it was below me to write mortgages like the loan officers. Listen, I'm not proud of that, but this is a real life story that I'm sharing so you can find yourself somewhere in it if you've ever been in a position where you've cost yourself something because of ego. So this ego of not allowing myself to do what I thought was an entry-level position cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars in possible commissions over that few years when Lori and I needed it most, when we were rebuilding financially. Silly, right? And then there were some incredible investment opportunities that came up during this time that I wasn't able to participate in that also cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars. See how your ego can start to really cost you an awful lot of money over time? And so I tell you that story because I don't want ego to cost you as much as it's cost me in the past. And another way that ego shows up, by the way, another way that it'll cost you is in perfectionism. And boy, did I suffer from perfectionism. You know, perfectionism is waiting until something is absolutely perfect before you do it because you're so afraid of putting it out there and having it not go right. And then, oh my God, what would people say? And so just like I explained, I was full of ego. I would only do things if they would turn out perfect. One of the best lessons though, over the years since then that Lori's taught me is that done is better than perfect. Otherwise you're going to miss too many opportunities. And so when I started my podcast just over a year ago, I had the opportunity to face myself in a mirror and see if I've really overcome ego as my greatest overhead. You see, I did like every other podcaster does when they're starting their podcast, and I pre-recorded eight to 10 episodes, and I picked the best guests I could possibly get to make a good first impression, and I used an hour of their time for each one of them, and when I was done with the recordings and sent them off to my podcast producer, he said to me, dude, what were you doing in the interviews? I can hear you clearing your throat in every single interview that you sent me over and over and over again. I mean, we're talking disgusting, like me going, "Eh, eh, eh, eh," (laughs) because here's what happened. I am not the most technologically savvy individual. And when they set up my podcast studio, they said, hey, if you just pull this button down, your guests won't hear you. And I took that as the recording wouldn't hear me, except the recording picked up everything I did and said every time I pulled that little button down. (laughs) And so I would clear my throat because I had a cold when I was pre-recording all these episodes. I would clear my throat and it was disgusting. And there was no way I could get these people to re-record these episodes because I already used their valuable time. So what did I do? Did I scrap it? Did I stop my tracks? Did I let perfectionism win? No, I had come so far that I said, you know what? Fix it the best you can, mute it out the best you can, and let's just put it out there. And this will make a great story for me to share one day for somebody else who might make a similar mistake. And so I've come a long way ever since I've created this nugget, so to speak, that ego is my greatest overhead. 
And I hope you see examples on how ego is always going to cost you more than any other bad investment you can possibly make. And when you can learn to mitigate ego, when you can learn to acknowledge it and work around ego, that might be the very one thing that causes everything to finally start falling in place for you. And when everything starts falling in place for you, that is when you actually get to lead that full circle rich life that we started out talking about. Now, listen, Lori and I have shared some pretty vulnerable stories. We've shared some pretty low moments in life, but we love doing it because when people message us that they have moved forward because of our story, that they learned something because of our story, that their life is better because of the lessons or the nuggets, so to speak, that we share, then that makes every single bit of sharing it worthwhile. So we decided, hey, let's share even more of them. And we put together a free video training series. So that if you like these four stories or five stories or six stories, whatever we just shared, there's even more of them with more lessons. So if you want to go get the free training, go to becomealigned.com. Again, free video training series. You're going to love it. It's more stories like this, more lessons like this at becomealigned.com. Now, here's the best part. Depending on when you're listening to this, we also launched an e-course called Aligned last year that is like really in-depth principles around our belief systems, around our rituals, and around tribe in how we have created this full circle rich life that we get to live right now, the life that I'm sure a lot of you aspire to have. Now, we only allow enrollment into that for like seven days. And some of you are going to listen before enrollment. That's great. As long as you opt in for the free training, we'll let you know when enrollment opens. Some of you are going to listen during enrollment. And if you want to participate in this, just go to becomealigned.com. And if enrollment is open, you'll see it there that it's open and you can join this e-course. And some of you are going to listen after, and you're just going to have to wait until we open it up again. But here's the bottom line. We love sharing every up and down and every lesson that's come from them with as many of you as possible. Because I really believe this. If every single one of us actually played to the fullest ability possible, then there would not be a single problem left in the world to solve. So go check it out. Free training, becomealigned.com. Check out our additional stories. We love you guys. We appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for letting us share some of our life's most embarrassing moments. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, It goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.